Our final speaker in this section before the coffee break is uh, Amber, ba Amber Bainline, who's the head of scientific computing up at Slack. Go ahead. I think uh, Amber wins the award of being the person we asked last, and she was very enthusiastic. So thank you, Amber. I think we asked you with like four days worth of <laughs> warning. So we appreciate that. So I appreciate the opportunity. And there were a number of different ways in which I could have approached this. I tended to take the approach of the perspective of a science facility. So I'll say a little bit more about that and what that means. And in some ways, it's a very nice complement to some of the other talks where we got the perspective of the researchers and sort of a high level understanding of, well, you know, from my perspective, what does the OSTP memo look like? Well, the boots on the ground are the people who actually have to implement these policies from the perspective of a user facility. So I'll say a little bit more about that. And uh, of course, the opinions I express are my own, although I'm in constant communication with my peers at other national laboratories, other DOE national laboratories. So first off, I don't know uh, how much any of you here knows about Slack at all. It's, it's up the hill, and it's, it's a really cool place. And it hosts three user facilities and a, and a variety of research programs. I'll say a little bit more about that. But it, it uh, has materials research, chemistry, astrophysics, cosmology, high energy physics, accelerator physics, and also plasma physics. So it's very, very broad in terms of the different scientific disciplines that are represented up there. Most of the funding for SLAC comes from two of the offices of the Office of Science and DOE. So people say DOE as if there's some was somehow monolithic. It's not, right? There's the Office of Science, which uh, sponsors the Open Science Labs. There's also the National uh, Nuclear Security Agency, which, or administration, which also sponsors labs as well. And I'm not going to talk at all about those. Primarily, the funding for SLAC comes from basic energy sciences and from high energy physics. And one of the other things to note is that many of the researchers at SLAX are, are users at other laboratories. They may not have the beam that they need at SLAX, so they may have to go somewhere else. Uh, they may need telescope time. They may need to have computing resources that we do not have available at SLAX. So there's very much an interplay within the laboratory system of people who are either users at their, at their host laboratory or users somewhere else. So we get a very much of a mix of these different types of uses within the uh, within any DOE laboratory. Slack is a relatively small laboratory as these things go. Uh, Berkeley, I, I believe there are people here for Berkeley, it's a, is about three times larger in terms of the number of people. In terms of the user facilities at Slack, and what happens at a user facility is people make proposals, and those proposals are peer reviewed, and then the experimenters are awarded time to work at that particular facility. We have a synchrotron light source at SLAC. There are actually uh, three others in the United States at DOE Open Science Laboratories, uh, one at Brookhaven, one at Berkeley, and one at Argonne. <clears throat> then we also have the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the LINAC coherent light source, which is the first functioning FEL. It's been in uh, use since about 2010. And this is a very new, very special facility. And uh, the beam time and, uh, for that is very much restricted. Very few people actually have access to that. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how that research program continues to grow over time as we come to a better understanding of how to get the most out of that particular facility. Then we also have another relatively new facility called FACET, which is used for accelerator science uh, research. And in terms of the number of users that come through those uh, facilities, most of the users come through at SSRL. Relatively few come through FACET at all. It's a very small uh, community there. And then the groups at, uh, there, there are six end stations at LCLS, and there's a relatively small user community there relative to what happens at a conventional synchrotron light source. So then just a little bit to sample the research. So there's a picture of the Atlas detector up there. Uh, some, Many of the uh, high energy physicists at SLAC uh, work on the ATLAS detector. Victoria talked a little bit about CMS, uh, which is the uh, companion experiment at the LHC to, uh, to um, uh, ATLAS. And then also what's shown in the middle there is the Fermi Glass Space Telescope, which looks at uh, high energy uh, X-rays, cosmic rays. And then we also do protein crystallography. Uh, what's shown in 
is a diffraction image from LCLS, which was, an, which was done on a very well-known virus and demonstrated some of the uh, techniques that were being used at LCLS and va validated them relative to um, conventional techniques, which then opened up the ability to use these nanocrystallography techniques in other, in other uh, viruses, which you could not study in a conventional way. There's also some uh, superconducting uh, materials research. And then one of the other things that, that is kind of fun that goes on at, uh, at SSRL is that the Archaeopteryx fossils are uh, often analyzed there. They've, they've been through a number of different series, and the most recent results that came from that, it took about three years uh, to develop the techniques, was to look and see what are the actual colors of the Archaeopteryx feathers. And it turns out that uh, they are debonair black and white. So one of the things that's, uh, I, that I have to do with many of the people is, within this group, there's a large acceptance and understanding of the importance of open access of data. This is not necessarily generally true with the user community within at, at any laboratory. So I have to try to work with them to understand, to help them understand what are the importance of going, uh, of going into this open access kind of, of world. And so one of the ways in which we can do that is to make a distinction in their, between the things that they do in terms of the data and what are the knowledge products associated with that. So I've, uh, I'm working with, um, somebody had asked a question earlier to the NSF speaker this morning about was the NSF going to fund some of the research associated with um, making uh, data more publicly accessible. And uh, at DOE, in uh, the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing, they're actually started, trying to start a program in order to do that. But that's something then we have to make the case that uh, this is part of the natural part of the portfolio of that office. And so one of the ways in which we're, we're trying to sell that idea is that there's this progression from data uh, through information to knowledge. <clears throat> and so uh, you know, this is the way we're kind of demonstrating that, and this is showing this in a fairly straightforward and obvious example, which has to do with the discovery of the Higgs boson. So again, Victoria talked a little bit about the amount of data that CMS had. I think she, she had some old uh, information with respect to the data rates. It turns out that these experiments are actually capable of taking much more data, and they can use it. Um, but the, uh, the, so the limiting factor is actually the, the data acquisition system. CMS was actually writing out at 1,000 events per second at the end of the, the last data taking run. So there's much more data available than uh, e even she had put forward. Now, that raw data, somebody had mentioned earlier um, that raw data should be published. Well, as soon as you say that to a high energy physicist, uh, the conversation stops and the Jeremiad starts. Because raw data to a high energy physicist is the stuff that comes directly off the data or directly off the detector, and that stuff has very low information content. It has to be calibrated, it has to be reconstructed. That's the next step in this uh, data to knowledge transition. And from that step, you actually get, have already considerable amount of knowledge that goes into developing the algorithms to get the physics objects that would then have measured properties that could then, in the next step, be analyzed and turn into results. So then, in the case of Atlas and CMS, uh, there were, in each case, 40 different channels that were analyzed for uh, the Higgs production. Uh, a lot of intense uh, competition within the collaborations. Uh, extensive machine learning techniques were used because this was not like a classic old style experiment where uh, the discovery just kind of popped up out from under, out from the background. So there, you know, this is not a good candidate for citizen science, I have to say. But the other thing about this is that no one really would have believed a discovery from one of those experiments if it had not been confirmed by the other, and so. While some people might think that the, the paper is an advertisement for, for this, I, I think actually in terms of the papers that were uh, generated here, that is an encapsulation of all of the knowledge that went into producing the results for the Higgs discovery and then provides a basis for other 
uh, analysis to go forward from there to try to understand what are you know what are the next steps to take scientifically, and uh, and and then also go back and look at see what the properties of the boson are. So, then coming back to this idea of uh, you know what do you do at a facility, uh, the the Office of Science uh, spoke. Uh, around the time that the OSDP memo became public, to each one of the uh, advisory panels uh, for each one of the offices and gave the same talk to say, here's how the Office of Science intends for people to approach this problem of data management. And I think they did actually a very nice job of this because they did not, um, they did not put this in normal DOE, very heavy-handed compliance kind of language. They wanted to try to get to the idea that preserving and sharing the data was something which would, in fact, move the state of the science forward. And to, to me, this was a, a very nice way of doing it uh, because as soon as compliance comes up, people's hackles really get up. And again, as we're trying to move people into this uh, new era, in any way we can make them comfortable uh, that, that's, that's something that's really helpful. And one of the things you notice here at the end of the slide, and this is directly from the Office of Science, not all data needs to be preserved or shared. And the costs and benefits of doing so should be considered. So this was something which was considerably a, a considerable relief to many of us who were trying to figure out how it is we were going to preserve and share extraordinary amounts of data, not all of which have scientific validity so, so what is the assessment of the state of data management at one of these uh, national labs? Well, it, it is completely all over the map. And the heavy weightness or the lightweightness of the system, it tends to scale with the volume of the data and the number of collaborators. So high energy physics, for example, has invested an extraordinary amount of money in managing data and in managing the scientific process of dealing with data. That's just because they have so many people who have to access it, and there's so much of it. This is definitely not true for the researchers who come to SSRL. In that particular case, um, the mobility of the data is primarily determined by what they can put on a thumb drive. They may not even come to SSRL. Uh, they may have their data shipped to them. So they have a very, very different way of looking at the data. And for them, the data may not have any longevity. So again, it's completely different for an LHC experiment, which is taking data for th in three-year runs, as opposed to somebody who's coming in taking data overnight at SSRL. And another thing had, that had come up is that there's just local practice that's very, very different across the domains. In astrophysics uh, and the astronomy community, long, long history of making their data available and public. Uh, that's not the case in many, other, um, in, in many other disciplines. I was on an experiment at Fermilab, and we actually did publicize our data from the, the first run. And the person who spearheaded that effort was considered to be a crackpot. So this was about 15 years ago. Um, he looks more like a visionary now. So one of the other things to remember, too, is that because of all of the difference and the variability in the data management, the range of systems in use is, is wildly <laughs> different. We still have uh, important data that are stored on paper plots. And there are efforts, in some cases, to digitize some of that information. Um, the, the professor over here who mentioned that you know, his, his uh, students' data are tuck, tucked away in uh, in, uh, di on disk, yes, well, we have that too, directory trees, and the file names are serve as the metadata. So if you can't figure out what your student's um, you know, particular file uh, naming scheme was, the data, uh, it turns out to be lost. Then again, you have also the cases where you have these full infrastructures uh, with well-established data, metadata, and provenance uh, tracking. So one of the things about this, that we have to remember is from the perspective of the facility, the facility doesn't consider that it owns the data. It considers that the collaborators own the data and the, the researchers. And so what that means as a general rule is that we accept the, we accept the 
access to the data based on who the researchers say should have access to it. And, but those mechanisms tend to be fairly lightweight, and we tend to let the research group have control over those. And, and again, the data is, is often controlled by the, the mobility. Um, most of these light sources, their policy on the data is you, you take the data and you have two weeks at the most to get it, to get it off our systems. And that provides some real challenges because that means that in terms of a data management plan, it is really entirely up to the researcher to figure out how it is they would support that data in a publicly accessible way for a long time period. So uh, one of the things to, uh, to remember too is that the reuse of data